Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21, interesting conversation he has. Let's look at it. Read along as I read out loud. Then someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So when, when Joanna and I first moved to Western PA, we lived in a, a, a little town called Washington, about, I don't know, about 40 minutes south of Pittsburgh, all right? And uh, that's where the Sumagos are from, by the way. Same, same place, yeah. Um, so we bought a house there, and it's the kind, it was the kind of house that Joanna liked. In fact, she did all the searching for, for this house uh, with our realtor. It, it was 100 years old. 100-year-old house, okay? And the kind she likes has ornate, big, large trim around the doors and windows, plaster walls, not that she cared about that. That was more of my problem. Plaster walls and uh, knob and tube electric. If anybody knows what knob and tube electric, but it was converted in some places of the house, um, but not others. Now, here in our house here, in our basement, we have two steel poles supporting the main beam of the house. Okay, but at our house in Washington, it was a tree. That's what was in the basement. It was just a big tree trunk. They didn't even bother to square it, you know, make it look like a beam. It was just, a, if you went downstairs in the basement, there was a tree in the middle of the basement, and that's what held up the entire house. Nothing wrong with that. It's apparently pretty effective after 100 years, um, but that's what it was. Now, what was really interesting about that house, though, was that there were closets inside the closets, right? So when you, when you were, went into the bedrooms and you opened up the closet, you found this other closet, a much smaller closet in the back of the closet. And it, was, it wasn't deep at all. In fact, you couldn't even fit a full-size hanger in it. And, and it was just enough floor space there for maybe you know, a few pairs of um, shoes. There were just hooks on the wall of that closet. And so, but I think the real reason that Joanna wanted that house is because she thought there might be hidden treasure in the walls. And uh, I can tell you because I did renovate every single room of the house. Um, but the only thing I found was a dead groundhog under the porch. So no treasure behind any walls or anything like that. Um, so people back then had small closets because, you know, they probably had a few outfits and maybe a couple pairs of shoes, or their work shoes for weekly work, and then maybe a nice pair of shoes for Sunday when they were going to church. All right, so that is the kind of people that Jesus is talking to here in what we just read. That's the audience. Is Jesus, Jesus is talking, it's interesting to me, Jesus is talking about greed to people who don't have a lot. They're mostly farmers, um, and they probably only had, if they were lucky, it, it, maybe one or two extra set of clothes. So there was no, uh, there was no insurance. There was no AFLAC in case you got injured or you know workman's comp or anything like that. If something tragic happened to you, your kids might get sold to be servants at another for another family that was richer. So your insurance and your retirement was your land. It was your property, and it was your family. 
So it was really important that you got married and that you had lots of children, especially boys. Owning property is what ensured your retirement. It's what ensured your survival, especially as you got older. So um, let's be honest here today. Uh, we, there are people even around here, even in the Langhorn area and, and, and this um, you know, Southern Bucks area who uh, have real poverty. And it might be because of drugs. It might be because of alcohol. It might be because of a bad relationship, a bad turn of events. But they're facing real poverty. And, and, and we encounter them from time to time. But what Jesus shows us here is that greed is part of the human condition. And it is found in people of all classes. Whether you're rich, middle class, or low class, it's... it's a uh, There's greed that can be found everywhere. And even if you're living paycheck to paycheck, even if you're you're depending on stuff or a certain lifestyle for your happiness, for your security, for your safety, that's actually what real poverty is. And for those who are worried about their kids and if their kids are going to be happy, whether you know they have enough things, let me tell you the best five toys in all of history. Okay, these are the the best five toys rated number one, uh, one through five in all of history. You ready? Number one, a stick. Number two, a box. Number three, string. Number four, a cardboard tube. And number five, my favorite, dirt. (laughs) All of which, or to say none of which require batteries, which is really great. In fact, we have a picture of Lila who fell asleep inside of a box and slept there all night because Bella decided to make it into a house. It was a box about this big and she cut windows in and drew curtains on there and even made a little baseboard and, and, uh, Lila crawled inside and got tired, and we just left her there the whole night because boxes are great. So if you're worried about your kids being happy because they don't have enough stuff, there's stuff all around that will make them very happy. Uh, If you really listen to the words of Jesus, you may start to notice that he's always cutting to the heart. He always wants to know what our motivation is. So He hears the words coming out of people's mouths, but he understands what's behind those words. In other words, you cannot fool Jesus. He's going to get to the heart of the matter. He's going to look behind the words and say, what really is our motivation? So there's this guy, and he calls out from the crowd, and he says, Jesus, help me sort out my difference, my problem with my brother, He won't share our father's inheritance. All right, Jesus replies to him, who made me judge over you to decide such things as that? Now, I need to push back on Jesus just a little bit here because I want to say, what do you mean? What do you mean, who are you to judge? Uh, You can heal blind people. You can raise people from the dead. You can walk on water. You make storms do what you say. You're the God man. I say that, yes, you're the guy who gets to decide, right? You get to be the judge between our problems and all of that. And so I don't think it's that crazy that this guy would would say to Jesus, hey, you you tell my brother to judge between us, to give me the part that that I deserve of, of our inheritance. So do we think that maybe Jesus is saying, well, we shouldn't have judges or we shouldn't have justice and we shouldn't have people that help us work out our disagreements? I don't think so. I think Jesus is getting, once again, he's cutting through the noise and he's getting to the heart of the matter. And this is really where it is because he says, life is not measured by how much you own. Now, we all know that. And we all probably would say that. But the question we have for ourselves today is, do we really live that way? See, the world tries to give uh, give rest, tries to offer peace, comfort, wholeness, one sort of way. But it doesn't seem to be working. In fact, the world's way seems to, to bring the opposite of those things. 
But in Jesus's world, or what we would say in God's kingdom, meaning and life, they come from a different place. So Jesus's mission wasn't to sort out people's legal matters. That's not what he came to do. Jesus came to show us what real meaning is, what real life is. He came announcing this kingdom. He kept saying, the kingdom is near, and that's different than the world that we live in. So Jesus sees through this man. He sees through his his complaint. He sees something that's in his heart. So what is that thing? Now, I think it's important to understand that greed is not always this sinister, evil, and very obvious, ugly monster. Sometimes it can be very subtle. It can creep in because it comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of wanting control and even self-reliance. And we can't have that in us and also have peace and rest. Those things are incompatible. So we'll never have true freedom because we'll always have this nagging thought. What if I lose control? What will happen if I lose control? So what we do is we, we live life like we play chess. If I could just anticipate two or three steps ahead, I'll make this move and then this move will happen. But life doesn't work that way. And that also means that we'll never take a chance. We'll never have what we call faith. We'll never risk. We'll never listen to the Holy Spirit because we'll always be trying to maintain control. We'll always be trying to anticipate what's coming next. In our hearts, instead of depending on Christ, we'll be depending on our own abilities. And the fact is, is the more we accumulate, the more we have, the higher the stakes. The more you have, the more you have to lose. And we might say to ourselves, well, I've worked, I've worked so hard to achieve all of this. Look how long and hard and how much I've put in. I would be devastated if I lost it all. Because if I'm responsible for getting it, then I'm responsible for keeping it. Jesus' response to that is, life is not measured by how much you own. So think about what, what we become when we walk in the kingdom of this world, when we start adopting the mindset and the ideas and the sense of peace and, and rest that the world cannot give us. But think about what we, be, we become when we try to adopt that kind of mentality. Well, one thing we see here is that we're going to fight with our family. We're going to fight with other people. Sometimes that might be uh, our family, it might be business partners, it might be even friends. But this guy yells out to Jesus, he says, tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, was this guy wrong? Was he, was he being treated unfairly? Was his brother trying to cheat him? Here's Jesus' response, beware. It's interesting. He says, watch out. What is he watching out for? You're becoming something else. You're becoming someone else. See, the kingdom of heaven is radically different. And the king of this kingdom is in charge. And he owns everything. But there's a little twist here. God owns everything, but yet life isn't measured by how much we own. It's not even part of the equation. Jesus says, I'm not getting into all of that. That's not what I'm interested in. I have an interest in who you are, not how much you have. But what we, what, what we have may be changing who we are. So he says, beware. It's a warning. Watch out. You're fighting and arguing. And that may be an indicator of who you're becoming. This may be, may be the worry in our lives and the anxiety or the frustration or the, the anger that we feel toward, be, toward someone else when we're cheated, and that creates all kinds of stress and anxiety. Maybe those, that's a signal, like on the dashboard of our life. Maybe it's saying something we should pay attention. Hey, check the engine. It, it's a good thing to have that light come on. Now, some people I've heard of, they take a piece of tape and they just cover over the, you know, on the dashboard and their vehicle's, you know, clunking along. No, there's nothing wrong. I don't have a light on. Let's look right there. I don't see a light. But, but that could be a really good thing. 
if, you, if, if we look at our lives and say, hey, I don't feel right. I'm, I'm stressed. I'm anxious. I'm nervous. I'm upset. I'm angry. Maybe that's an indicator of something else that's going on. 